Good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully you're still awake. I know, I think normally this is meant to be the, uh, the slot when everybody's lunch starts kicking in. So hopefully um, <clears throat> I'll manage to keep you a little bit awake on sustainability. Um, uh, firstly, thank you for the invite. So um, as a bit of kind of introduction, I'm not kind of um, sort of, let's say, a long-termer in the uh, archaeology industry. So if you guys start using acronyms, please do expect me to look blankly at you um, in the same way that you guys would do if I start using sustainability acronyms as well. So um, we'll try and keep a, a kind of like an even, if you like, dialogue going where, where we're both confused. Um, so I, I, I work for Spring Environmental, that's my company, um, and I'll firstly, if you'll, you'll give me kind of two minutes, I'll kind of get, tell you a little bit about us, obviously how we've got to, to being here today, and then we'll go into kind of like basics of carbon footprinting, some of the corporate carbon reduction frameworks, which builds on what you've heard from, from Dan earlier today, um, and then we'll kind of have... I've, I've put in question and answers, but frankly, I don't really like talking for 20 minutes in one direction. So if people have questions along the way, please free, feel free to kind of put their hands up and, and ask them because I'd much more, you know, kind of prefer that two-way dialogue than, than you just listening to my voice for, for long periods of time. So just to kind of give you a bit on Spring Environmental, as a company, it's been around since 2013. Um, it sort of like major starts. We do a lot of work on supply chain sustainability for um, BT and open reach. Um, and we have done, as I say, since 2013. So in terms of supply chain sustainability, I'm probably one of the longest tenured people in this topic, um, which makes me feel old, um, but also that I got into it before it was cool. Um, we also, um, you know, we work on UK infrastructure and design. That's primarily another Chris. Not everyone in the organization is called Chris, um, but that's Chris with a K. Um, <clears throat> and he's been working on the A417 project, um, who, um, so that's the uh, sort of air balloon roundabout that you used to hear on Radio 2, that there'd be an accident every five minutes. Um, we do work as outsourced environment sustainability leads for organizations that are very keen on sustainability in terms of driving it forward, but also kind of, um, let's say, find it easier to hand it over to the people who've done it for long periods rather than try and lumber it onto a poor health and safety person or similar, um, because we tend to kind of obviously, you know, essentially we can do it quicker, faster because we, we know the topic. And, but primarily why I'm here today is that um, we're contracted to work with Cotswold and also Oxford Archaeology. So Dan here and Luke was obviously speaking earlier as well, have, uh, have had to en endure, I mean, enjoy my, my um, uh, presence in, the, in their companies too. So we, we can provide environmental support across all project phases. So doing life cycle assessment through, we got 14 million pounds um, out of the Welsh government for a plastics recycling um, sites by being able to prove that it was above and beyond um, what's classed as, it's, they're called best practice guides, but essentially what's sort of the minimum bar setting by being able to show that we could get quite significant funding for a, for a 50 million pound site. We can do site feasibility and environmental impact assessments all the way through to environmental management systems and, and net zero and supplier decarbonisation. So we can help companies across the board. And that's the team. Um, as I say, we've got Fraser who's based in Leeds and Charlotte's based in Bristol. Um, so we're not just me. So on to the basics of carbon footprinting, and it sounds very easy, and as we've heard, there are a number of tools on, on board, but what will kind of come here is, um, I'm gonna ask actually the audience, because I said I don't like talking in one direction. Right? Um, could anybody here tell me the difference between um, carbon neutral and net zero? Congratulations on that, on the uh, zero to landfill. That's um, good, um, but no, <laughs> fundamentally. So um, in theory, if, we, you, if you want to be carbon neutral, you can have any carbon footprint you like, as long as you buy enough offsets to go in the opposite direction. Um, 
that was kind of like quite a, um, as you can imagine, if you think about the sort of mathematics of that at the basic level, well, you know, fundamentally that means you can still grow your emissions by hoping that obviously your, your offsets equal and opposite, but you're still adding that amount to the atmosphere anyway. So, um, so, you know, you're just trying to prevent someone else doing the same amount. So you still end up, if you like, with one unit rather than two units being added to the, to the atmosphere. Whereas net zero is much more kind of, and we'll get onto the definition of it, is, is, is actually not zero, net zero at all. If you take the science-based targets initiative, it's basically saying you need to reduce your emissions by 90% by a target date, and then you're allowed to find kind of offsets that come from kind of essentially like forestry and similar kind of biological kind of absorption out of the atmosphere. So that's how you get to kind of the difference between the two. And there's, there's quite a fundamental difference in there in which you can be a carbon neutral company and be growing your carbon footprint, whereas net zero is very much you need to be kind of coming down in line with climate science. So that, that's kind of killed some of my presentation later, but at least it was good to find out that the vast majority of people are kind of going, yeah, we need to do net zero and national highways are asking something. I have no idea what it is. <laughs> um, so, so this kind of presentation will hopefully be a, a little bit of help to you in that case. I'm only going to do one kind of, uh, um, Dan kind of told you more about the kind of structures and the sort of reporting means and all that kind of stuff. But fundamentally, all of that is driven by this kind of graphic, which is that if we don't really do anything, we end up in that red band. And that red band is basically, we don't, we kind of know it's not going to be good, but we don't really know how bad it's going to be in some ways. Um, you know, we're already seeing, you know, um, sort of changes and, you know, if you if you talk or listen to the kind of head of the UK army, what does he see as being the biggest driver of global instability and wars and so on going on? Oh, well, it's climate change. So, you know, we can talk about small boats and um, trying, apologies, trying to get too political here, but actually we are trying to push people out of the center of the globe towards the top um, just by the fact that we're making their life uninhabitable. So we talked about sustainability structures, and this one is the one that underpins pretty much everything. Um, it is something that is um, both helpful and can be quite infuriating to read, because usually you'll have a specific kind of question or um, kind of like, let's say, nuanced bit for your industry that it fundamentally doesn't answer. Um, so it, it is something that's quite, it's both very useful, but you've also got to accept that like by writing a sort of if you like a, a protocol and a standard for ev that's suitable for everyone, it also has kind of particular issues as well for, for particular industries. Um, and it's, it is constantly being updated, um, not particularly frequently now in terms of its kind of the standard side, but the additional guidance that comes with it, particularly on kind of scope three emissions that we've talked about, tends to get updated um, fairly, fairly regularly. And so there are big kind of like parts to a carbon footprint <clears throat> and the standard requires you to make sure that you're kind of um, there are sort of underpinning themes to your carbon footprint which firstly is that they are relevant and that they are able to ref accu accurately or adequately reflect the company's greenhouse gas emissions serve the needs of decision makers and and um, and also the users they should be complete as possible so you will often find people going let's kind of ignore scope three because it's kind of difficult um, and realistically for kind of completeness we're getting out of that zone now um, as we realize kind of how sort of purchase goods and services is such a massive part of most people's carbon footprint the reason why i've been working on bt's supply chain sustainability um, program for for over 10 years now is because they realize quite quickly that actually somewhere between two thirds and 70%, depending on the year um, of their carbon footprint is in their supply chain. It's the people who are making all the electronic equipment in China that actually is the vast majority of their footprint, despite the fact that they use 1% of the UK's electricity. And I think that's just selling. They use 1% of the UK's total electricity um, supply to make sure that we can talk and text and, and watch YouTube. Um, and it's still you know, two thirds in the supply chain. The rest of it, if you can do your maths of, of kind of figuring out, um, is actually in people's homes and their equipment being used in people's homes as well. So actually their operational 
um, sort of in their own fence is actually relatively small. Consistency, so using consistent methodologies and transparently document any changes. Um, so it isn't unusual that like people realize that there were calculation errors and um, in carbon footprints um, and um, you know that, that sometimes you may need to update them because different data sets become available. It should be transparent, so there's a clear audit trail. They're factual and coherent, um, and they disclose any assumptions made, because usually there isn't perfect um, kind of information for us to do a carbon footprint. Um, a very quick example is say we do work for um, somebody who's rolling out fiber broadband on, on, on um, the sort of uh, account of, of open reach, and they almost don't know what sites they have on, at any one moment in time. They just have construction sites going on and temporary sites all over the country and they rent bits out from farmers and, all, and you know, use that to store kind of um, telegraph poles and things like that. And for obvious reasons, they never actually ever really pay an energy bill. So how do we, but they know they use energy when they're there, they're plugged into those sites, but we've got no recorded means. So we need to kind of have a methodology to include that that also recognizes that there are assumptions implicit within that. Um, and we have to do it in a most in a sort of robust and defendable way as possible. And then the sort of the accuracy. So we try and reduce uncertainty quite often over time. Um, there is a sort of tendency for a lot of people doing carbon footprints to try and do the sort of bottom up approach and trying to be as super accurate on everything right from the first point of go. My argument is actually you can waste a huge amount of time on that and there's a much better way of doing it, which is you find out which of your big emitters are in a kind of quicker and dirtier kind of way of doing the calculation, then you refine your way into that over time. There's, there's guidance as well and that will kind of help you because usually within most kind of carbon footprinting categories, there's kind of like different levels of approaches um, and you can kind of go from the sort of the fastest, least kind of amount of data required from you all the way to the one that's the most accurate. Um, and as I say, sometimes, you know, there's a, there's a time and a place for all of those kind of approaches. So if you've heard about scope one, scope two, scope threes, um, we're just gonna quickly count. So the quickest way to really describe scope one is basically you take something and you turn it into CO2. So whether that be natural gas being turned into kind of like water and CO2, whether that be fuels you buy for your vehicles. Um, and then the other one is uh, sort of within scope one emissions is typically sort of fugitive emissions. So if you have air conditioning units, they have very highly kind of potent um, greenhouse gas um, sort of um, potential gas refrigerants in um, and sometimes they will leak um, and, and they can be and ironically they're in heat pumps so obviously we're pushing towards heat pumps while they have quite massive um, sort of greenhouse gas potential when they go pop. Um, scope 2 emissions are essentially where you purchase energy but you're not the one doing the burning of the of the um, of the actual kind of original fuel so for the vast majority of people that's electricity and um, but we have a, a large hedge fund as a client who we're not allowed to mention by name but they have an office in um, in New York and they their actually office is heated by steam from the kind of like district network so they purchase steam energy um, they're the only client we've ever come across that Scope two isn't just electricity for them. And then scope three is everything else. So there's both upstream scope three, which generally are kind of like the goods and services you buy, um, capital goods, so vehicles and so on, all the way through to like business travel, um, employee co commuting, which actually includes, believe it or not, working from home, the environmental impact of people working from home. And then I always think that this kind of diagram was done as if assuming everyone's a manufacturer. You have all this stuff kind of on, is that the pointer? No, um, on this side of it, which is kind of like all about the use of sold goods and so on, which um, for a lot of organizations is only really relevant if you sell a computer, a car or something like that. Um, but there are further over, there are kind of stuff about franchises and investments as well. Um, I don't think that's probably too relevant. Um, certainly wasn't for Cotswold Archaeology that they, they also happen to have franchises um, you know, across the, across the country but it can be relevant. And we have found that in a lot of people's net zero planning, I did the uh, um, 
the sort of critical review for one public body that they'd fundamentally missed out a load of organizations that they are investment across the globe that they're invested in out of their, their emissions planning. So if you look at the Cotswold value chain, so what does that kind of mean? How do we sort of transmit that scope one, scope two, scope three stuff into something that actually kind of makes more sense to us as an organization? We tend to break it up into kind of like the core, if you like, of their operations, which tends to be around transport. It tends to be around um, running the kind of buildings um, and then kind of people getting to and from those buildings, whether that be for business travel purposes and commuting. Um, and then the kind of stuff that we buy, which is upstream, and then kind of things that are downstream. In this one, we haven't really got them, but for certain organizations, it can be much more kind of um, relevant. And I've just color coded these. I'm assuming all these slides will be available to everyone afterwards. Um, we talked about, um, Dan mentioned about um, for SECR. So this is streamlined energy and carbon reporting. So this is for all large companies who have two of the following three. Um, now I've forgotten all the turnover figures, um, but essentially more than 250 employees. The turnover is around about 40 million and a balance sheet of, apologies, somebody's trying to ring me, um, and a balance sheet of over around 18 million. And you need to have two of those three. And I think certainly from speaking to, to Neil at Cotswold, we, mi we hit one of those criteria, but we don't hit two. And therefore we, do have to, we don't have to report against SECR. But strangely, in true government fashion of inconsistency, um, they, do have to, they do fall into something called ESOS, which is the Energy Savings Opportunity Scheme, um, which is a related scheme where it's, you either have 250 employees or you meet those two financial metrics. And because they're sort of the, if you like, where the or sits um, in it, you can be in ESOS, but not in SECR, which is quite odd, but it does happen. But anyway, what you can see here is kind of what you're required to report, if you like, as part of that SECR. And I would say that they are the sort of, if you like, the more normal and standard kind of parts of people's carbon reporting because they relate to the sort of electricity, fuel, um, and business travel um, aspect. All right. So fundamentally on this, like, um, unless we uh, kind of had a little machine in the tailpipe of every single car and every single boiler that measured the volume of, um, of gas going through and also the CO2 um, sort of, uh, if you like, carbon content of that gas, um, unless we had that, we will always have a carbon footprint that's, if you like, calculated by a different methodology. And that methodology that we tend to be is kind of like essentially boiled down to this activity factor times by a carbon factor. And that activity factor tends to be sort of like the kilowatt hours of electricity you use, the liters of diesel. It could be the number of pounds spent on subcontractors. It could be the number of miles traveled. Um, and then usually there will be sort of like a carbon factor that goes with it. Um, and then your kind of choice of those carbon factors should kind of largely be sort of dependent on a few things. So when you choose a carbon factor, th this has been sort of, if you like, cribbed from life cycle assessment, the ISO for life cycle assessment, but it, carbon footprinting is essentially a kind of, let's say a one dimensional version of, of environmental life cycle assessment. So you're looking at sort of temporal, so you're looking at using a carbon factor that was uh, produced as close to the time of the activity in question. Um, it amazes me because DEFRA haven't updated their supply chain carbon figures since 2011. I st I'm still seeing organizations who are carbon footprinting their supply chain, including public sector ones um, who've spent fortunes on this, using these figures from 2011. Now, Life has changed quite a lot from 2011. And what makes it even worse is then you get people doing manual adjustments on those carbon, on those carbon factors going, well, so I've seen um, in part of the critical review we've done, well, this factor was produced in 2011 and the electricity um, uh, sort of uh, grid has decarbonized by 30% since 2011, between 2011 and 2020. And so we reduced all of these factors by that 30%. And I sort of said, that, that's cool, right? So um, do you think because the electricity grid has decarbonized by 30% that transport fuel has decarbonized by 
No, okay, so that factor's wrong. Did you buy your computers that were solely made in the UK? No, so and you can see how quickly organizations, because they're struggling to use free kind of like carbon factors, get themselves out of kilter um, and end up like ultimately people, when they do go doing a carbon factor, you will end up with a number and you don't really know how reliable it is. And this is kind of like a frequent problem that we're dealing with quite, quite a lot. And we try, obviously, as, as our organization, we spend thousands of pounds a year getting up to date data sets um, to keep, keep this from being a problem. You want geographical, so obviously, again, you kind of clearly you don't want a carbon factor for the US when your activity is taking place in the UK. Technological, you'll see this in a lot of the carbon factors. You know, there are carbon factors coming through for electric vehicles relative to diesel vehicles and similar. So clearly, you'd want to kind of harmonize everything as close to reality as possible. And then you want that factor to be part of a widely recognized data set. So I've put here the sort of simple and free one that most people use, which is the Bayes annual carbon factors. But for supply chain footprinting, I'd really recommend not using that. Well, they, don't, they haven't produced any new ones since 2011. And the reason why they haven't produced any since 2011 was that their methodology bounced around all over the place between 2009 and 2011. And everybody started complaining that their carbon footprint as an organization was jumping up and around every year out, outside of their control. So obviously government being government, where the decision was, well, we'll just take the factors away then. So the boundary changes, we'll talk about a bit more about um, purchase goods and services. If everybody wants one, you can ask, ask the question. The one, one of the other things that was quite frequently forgotten about when doing carbon footprinting is like thinking about the boundary of the organization. So what's included, what's in excluded. Um, and quite often this becomes a problem because if you set yourself a target of a reduction, let's say 50% by 2030 seems to be a very common one at the moment. Um, and you realize actually, well, we've, we've acquired another organization. Um, can you were just mentioning about acquisition, growth by acquisition? Well, suddenly actually my carbon foot, I'm trying to say I'm reducing it, but I've now got an organization that's 50% bigger because we've acquired some, somebody. Alternatively, there may be divestment and so on and so forth. And fundamentally, you do have to basically change your baselines to reflect these kind of situations. And it's not something that most people are kind of that comfortable with, particularly if the, la the organization you've just purchased doesn't really have any good records on which to, to base that, that rebaselining. Um, there are other reasons as well. So outsourcing or insourcing of emitting activities, particularly the guidance says if you move things from kind of like you used to manufacture it yourself and you've decided to outsource it to, you know, manufacturer in East Asia and so on. Um, and clearly you would also want to rebaseline if you realize you've made calculation errors. And that is a very frequent one when we review, um, review carbon footprints. Um, the one thing that you shouldn't rebaseline from, and, and just for if I haven't made it too obvious, obviously this whole point of the the, um, the the picture is about making sure that we're always comparing apples to apples when we're looking from year to year. The one thing you don't do, and this is again fundamentally, um, like I think the sustainability industry as a general rule is is maturing, but there are quite we get some I would think of as quite basic questions coming from people who have head of sustainability. So recently, one of the questions that I was asked was, well, we're getting rid of those sites and we're acquiring those sites and we're doing this. Do I have to re-baseline? And I said, well, no, fundamentally, that's an organic change to the organization. You've not acquired any new, new sort of like um, parts of the business and you're just changing the estate essentially. And you cannot kind of like ultimately then just chop and change your baseline because you'd be doing it every year, frankly, for most organizations or a lot of organizations, but also you'd be trying to trick yourself in like, um, you know, that if you spend all your time re-baselining, you never actually have to do the reduction side. So the last thing I kind of, I think I've, I've got is all carbon footprints have a level of uncertainty. So I, I'm quite happy to hold my hand up and say that every carbon footprint I've done is almost certainly wrong. Um, the question is whether or not it's kind of that within that boundary or that boundary. And the reality is that most, all, most carbon footprints and even the online tools do not do any form of assessment of why, how big that uncertainty is. Um, and that becomes problematic because if you reduce it, but your boundary of uncertainty was that wide to begin with, you don't actually know if you've just got 
variation with that within that boundary of uncertainty. Um, and so the simple kind of like example here is that um, we talked about that SECR reporting. who are doing carbon footprinting for an organization that makes um, rebar steel. Um, and they actually time their production as to when there's more um, renewables in the grid in Wales now. And part of that is because the cost reduces. And when you're putting a, something that costs five million pounds a month into to melt electricity, you obviously you know, will produce more when, when it's cheaper. But that also affects their carbon footprint quite significantly. And if they just use standard grid average factors, then you, know, you end up actually massively increasing their carbon footprint relative to the, the reality of the situation. So there is always uncertainty in there. The question you've got to, you know, you've got to ask is like, how much does it affect the final outcome? And have we been able to control those inaccuracies as much as possible? So that's kind of whirlwind uh, introduction, I guess, and, and some warnings um, around carbon footprinting. Are there any, before I move on to the bits about the corporate carbon reduction frameworks, are there any questions here to stop me just being unidirectional? Yes and no. Um, so the answer to it is in your, if you like, uh, is by having a sort of like gross and net carbon footprint so that you would have kind of like the gross carbon footprint would include their carbon footprint, but you know, in whatever proportion you purchase of that particular supplier's output, um, you would include that. And then if you are comfortable, and this is the way, again, this is a bit where there isn't that great guidance on the topic, so it's a really good question. Um, if you are comfortable that those offsets that they've purchased are, if you like, sufficiently robust enough for you to be confident in, which is a big question, um, given that everything we've probably seen recently around Vera and those forestry carbon footprints, then you would take them off and you would end up with a net carbon footprint figure. Does that make sense? So, yes, yeah, you would do. The number of people who have that level of data yet at this moment in time is very, very rare. Yeah, it tends to be sort of the bigger corporate entities. Um, but, you know, from, we do, we, as I say, I'm not, not kind of naturally in archaeology, um, sort of spent a lot of time in this industry. We work on supply chain um, reduction in the print industry as well as, um, and we are, you know, a number of those print suppliers are sort of going, yes, we've got offsets for the paper that we use and this, that, and the other. And actually, when you look into the robustness of those offsets, they're pretty dubious, to be honest. Um, and so within our carbon footprint, we've just ignored them. We've just ignored them. So we then had to purchase offsets um, for, for their carbon neutral project, which is kind of odd because you're sort of then going, well, we're now offsetting the, you know, purchasing, double purchasing the offsets. But actually, that's probably a more reliable way than, um, than you know, some, having looked at some of those projects, we can't see how they would actually um, have actually resulted in an overall net decrease in emissions. Um, sorry, there was another question at, at the back. Sorry. Yeah. Hmm. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. So if the business is growing, um, kind of, and it's, it, you know, you're still the same limited entity. So, you know, business has been very good. You need, I don't know, a new office um, in a particular area that would just be included in your, um, in your um, kind of like carbon footprint. And you wouldn't kind of try and go back and say, well, when I'm comparing to my 2020 baseline, um, you know, you wouldn't try and shift that 2020 baseline around to to a, um, a sort of um, reflect that that growth. Um, it is a bit of a challenge actually, because the net zero standard, which we'll get onto in a bit, so I'm talking ahead of it, requires you to almost have like a four percent ish kind of slope down 
And then if you're a growing kind of like environmental services company, such as ourselves, um, you, are, you are growing, you are having sort of image. So to be net zero compliant is actually sort of slightly counter when as an organization, we're also um, outside of what we can count as an organization. We're helping other organizations reduce their carbon footprint in sort of like multiples of 10 bigger than our carbon footprint is growing. Does that make sense? So we, we're actually, as an organization, Spring Environmental could not apply for the net zero standard because we're growing and we're supporting people to decarbonize. Now, there is a sort of like um, paper out from the Science-Based Targets Initiative to say, well, how do we kind of like account for this kind of what they call out of value chain emissions reductions? Um, but there's no agreed methodology at the moment. So, so for us, actually, as an organization, much as though we try and do the right things and, you know, um, but, um, sort of travel is our primary impact, we couldn't actually, with hand on heart, apply for that standard at the moment. And just go, go on. Sorry. So just to continue, thank you very much for that elaboration because your point about no read baselining for organic growth, and you just picked up on. Mm. It said to me, oh, because some, some, some of the organizations in, in this room are really, really micro. And yeah. you employ four people, and then next year you've, you've attracted one new member of staff. Yeah. And suddenly you've got a 20% increase in the daily activity. And I, I know there's at least one organization in this room that has grown from one person to 80. Yep. But, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's basically to stop you kind of constantly rebaselining, then and then resulting in this sort of the potential for greenwashing. Frankly, um, so I kind of see it in that way that is kind of positive. What I don't necessarily see is quite so positive is the fact that when you talk about net zero as the kind of standard, which I think is very very good, it's been written by people who are writing for big corporates. So it's not the there is a small business kind of like slightly lowered um, kind of like expectation for um, but what it, do, what, it, what it does is it also says you have to do it on absolute emissions. You cannot have any intensity metrics. Whereas if you're a large company under the net zero standard, you can have an intensity metric, which frankly, as I say, that's the reason why we at Spring Environmental couldn't actually apply for the net zero standard at this moment in time. It's something I suspect as with all of these things in sustainability, there will probably be, you know, iteration two, and I think it will be updated. Um, so going into the corporate carbon reduction frameworks. Um, so it talks about net zero. So let's. Um, I originally put this one out, only one slide in because I, um, I saw Dan's topic, although not the slides before I'd written these, um, written my own slides. So if we talk about net zero, what I'm talking here about is the science-based targets initiative version of net zero. There are some others out there um, um, which are, let's say, less strong. Um, and there also are an increasing number of management consultancies that are setting up their own, um, let's say, um, sort of, uh, if you like, stamps of approval where they're, where they're kind of um, uh, doing their own homework and then marking, marking their own homework, which um, I've done work for one of them, um, and I had to get this building and this site to net zero, and fundamentally I couldn't get the modeling of this building to look anything like the, what they told me the gas usage of this site was, right? And so I'm like there and I'm scratching my head and there's a, we, we use a very complicated kind of set of sim, building simulation software. Where, you know, you try and calibrate it to how, how it works in reality and then you kind of make all your changes in theory so you can then obviously know what the best way forward is for a building. And, and, and I was sat there and I spent days tearing my hair out because I was like, I cannot make this building use as much gas as they tell me this building uses. I cannot do it. And then eventually my brain switched and went, Maybe it's not me. Maybe it's them. And I went and I went back and I said, "Can you tell me how you calculated the carbon footprint for the gas for the for this site, please?" And they went, "Well, we could only get two bills, and they were in January and February, so we multiplied them by six. Right. So you've taken the two heaviest months of the year, you've multiplied them by six. 
And when you go on their website, they'll say, typically people, when they engage with us, will reduce their carbon footprint by 30% in the first year. And I sit there and go, yes, because all you did was actually accurately measure their consumption in, year, in, the, first, in the year after. So I'm, I'm very, very sort of, if you like, cynical about, let's say, a number of organizations out there who are both developing the carbon footprint and then giving you a seal of approval on it. That's not to say I'm not also cynical about the third parties, because I've got, also got a friend who works for one of the certification bodies. And of 25 people who are signed off to do their um, to do corporate carbon footprinting, 24 of them had never calculated a carbon footprint before. So just think about that. You've got corporate you know, people who are asking you to get BSI, SGS, or one of the others. It wasn't them, by the way. Um, I've deliberately missed out the name who have never done carbon footprinting signing off corporate accounts. And that's where we are as a state of an industry. It's quite tricky at the moment. It's, it's a bit wild westy, as, as people have heard me say. Having said that, I do think net zero is probably one of the stronger frameworks around because when you apply for net zero, it is not um, the people who assess it at Science Based Targets Initiative, they've had no input into developing the, uh, the evidence pack that goes into it. That's kind of typically my job, and it's up to my job to be able to show that we've can have, we have a five-year plan at least on how we're going to achieve that kind of carbon reduction. So net zero kind of basically is saying, as an organization, we're going to try and reduce, we're going to reduce our carbon footprint in line with the kind of one and, one and a half degree um, uh, limiting of climate change. It must include the value chain. So you cannot just include your um, footprint from your, um, your buildings and your, and your transport and then forget about everything else that goes on around you. So people traveling to work, people, you know, the purchases and of, of, you know, whatever equipment. And I think for Cotswold, um, from memory, it was the purchase goods and services was by a country mile, the largest um, uh, uh, sort of, if you like, source of carbon emissions. We want a required a decarbonization of around 4% per year with a minimum 90% reduction by the target date. And the target date must be before 2050. So some organizations will set 2035. Um, we've seen um, for those who are kind of like well on their way already, um, but ultimately 2050 is, is this sort of like notional um, from UNP, the UN Climate Change Group, but also that translates into UK policy as well. You're not allowed to use offsets until that target date. So you are not supposed, you cannot basically go, I've done my 4% reduction by purchasing offsets. That is not allowed under the um, net zero. You can do it as well, but you cannot do it in, in place of reducing your carbon footprint. Um, so you can also, you can be heading towards net zero and carbon neutral at the same time. It's not, it's not an impossible thing to do. Um, but it also, net zero, is, it does require kind of the collaboration of all stakeholders to work together to solve a global issue. It's not something that any, any organization can do on its own, um, you know, fundamentally. So I've mentioned, um, so we talked about various PAS, or PAS has been thrown around earlier today. So I'm going to be sort of specific about the different kind of versions. There's PAS 2050, which is one about product um, carbon footprinting, and um, we've got PAS 2060, which was written back around 2014, I think. Um, certainly, it's not new, and it was a carbon neutral standard. And a number of organizations jumped on it. Marks and Spencers, I think, were on it for a while, I think, and um, Kia, I think, from memory as well. Um, but it, and most have moved on from PAS 2060 now. And they moved on for the reasons, and I apologize, by the way, if anybody's red, green, colorblind, because I really should have thought about this with our marketing team before I created green as being our dominant color. Um, so, um, you know, the carbon neutral standard basically has kind of um, four main parts. You measure, and these are quite similar across all of the schemes, frankly. Um, you need to measure your carbon footprint, fairly obvious. You need to then have a plan to reduce it. You then buy your offsets, which have certain requirements against them, and then you report it on an annual basis. And it kind of, and then usually you need, um, you know, you can self-verify. You can get a consultant to verify. You can get the, any of the th sort of third third-party verification bodies to give it the official seal of approval. But there are kind of issues around the particularly past 2060, which is 
there are kind of clauses within it which say, you know, basically you can, you can ignore parts of your value chain if you deem, and that's the company themselves, not anyone else, that the data collection is deemed too costly or onerous. And so when you see a lot of PAS 2060 reports online, people go, we've just kind of ignored this bit because we, di we decided it was too costly. Okay, well, right, so you're only offsetting part of your carbon footprint and you don't know whether the bit that you've ignored is the biggest part or not. So not necessarily the most robust kind of approach to it. And then you go into the reduction. So you must set yourself reduction. You must have a reduction plan. Okay, my reduction target is 0.1%. Cool, that's fine. Absolutely fine by past 2060. And you see that, and I've actually seen worse where people go, our plan is not to be worse than last year. And that is okay. You then get to the offsets and you go, right, well, you just, you have to, the, the offsets that you choose, they have to be third party verified projects. Now, the problem is there's no standard around who those third party verification bodies are either. So, you know, you've seen, probably seen them in the news and the guy at Vera, um, the CEO has lost his job because we've been basically creating offsets that didn't really have any meaningful difference over time as well. So fundamentally, um, it's, it's, you get to that part. And then you've got the reports, as I mentioned, they can be verified at different levels. Um, it doesn't have to be third party verification. As you've heard, I've got my doubts about them anyway. Um, but ultimately you can kind of claim that you've done it internally. Um, and actually you don't really have to detail how, let's say you've done an internal audit to be able to sort of like show that, you know, the numbers of, and everything that you're doing is real. So if you're not careful, it can actually look more like an exercise in greenwashing. Um, it's not that they all are, but you know, if you really push the, the standard to the limits of what was allowed, it could look like that quite easily. So the next one is PPN 0621. So um, for those of you who are working in public sector, um, this is a requirement now for any contract over 5 million. Um, and it is a requirement for a carbon reduction plan. Um, and fundamentally, it kind of has those parts that net zero and, and also um, <clears throat> uh, PAS 2060 have, which is that you need to measure and you need to reduce, have a reduction plan, and then you need to report. So that cycle kind of goes round. Um, I find it curious, um, frankly, um, on the public sector, because they say you need to report scope one and two emissions, upstream transport, waste, business travel, employee commuting, and downstream transport. And for some organizations, they won't even be anywhere close to their most significant carbon footprint emitters. But that's what you're told to do. And actually for some organizations that we've had to do um, help with carbon reduction plans, we've actually had to say, these categories are not relevant for this reason. Um, you know, particularly kind of downstream transport is only really relevant if you manufacture and you move things on. It's not really relevant to most kind of service-based organizations. Um, I should also say that it requires a commitment to net zero by 2050 as well. So it's kind of aligned in those. Um, an outline reduction plan for each of the emission categories is required. And then there's a report which must be placed on the company website and updated annually. And now my kind of big issue, I guess, or, or sort of um, let's say with, with this is that the way that in which it's marked by the public sector at the moment is on a pass fail marking approach. It's not. And so the consequences, I've seen carbon reduction plans where they basically kind of go in our buildings emissions. We will reduce our emissions by the fact that the electricity grid will reduce its emissions over time. So essentially what they're saying is we're going to do nothing. And then on the transport, they say, we're expecting that electric vehicles will become more and more part of kind of like our employees, um, if you like, uh, uh, sort of like um, vehicle set, um, and we will reduce our carbon footprint that way. So essentially, they've written a carbon reduction plan, which, which passes all the requirements of the public sector 10 by saying we're not going to do anything, actually, proactively. But we have counted our carbon, so that's cool. Um, so it is fun again fundamentally that one is kind of um, is kind of an interesting one as you can imagine from us as an organization we try and do everything to the best of our ability and with the right kind of mindset um, we're not necessarily 
to be honest, if there were clients in the room who sort of went, what's the, you know, Chris, what's the minimum I can get away with? I'd probably say, I think you need to talk to another consultancy. So PAS 2080, um, PAS 2080 has been, um, is a standard basically, so moving on, is to reduce the carbon impact of infrastructure in the built environment. Um, the national highways expect tier one and tier two contracts to have third party accredited PAS 2080 system at the organizational level by 25. Um, and the way that we, we see it sort of working and um, Dan at Oxford, we've had lots of emails and, and within Cotswold as well as a group about how are we going to deal with this. And actually the sort of the way that we've kind of come to view it, or maybe I've come to view it, and they've just, they've just nodded with me, I don't know, um, is that net zero is actually the destination and PAS 2080 is much more about the vehicle. Um, PAS 2080 is kind of like much more a process based, um, if you like, uh, standard um, in which it's expecting certain things of you as an organization, but there's no actual kind of like um, sort of goal in the way that net zero says you must reduce by 90% by 2050. There's nothing in the past 2080 that says that. Says that. Um, and so within past 2080, just kind of like to give you guys a bit of structure and then brings hopefully some relevance to archeology. span if, if nothing I've said so far has any relevance to you guys um, and archeologists, um, I apologize. Um, but the standard in PAS 2080 basically says there are four roles within PAS 2080 and you must choose one. Um, and they are asset owners. So these are the people that typically, you know, national highways, um, probably shouldn't mention water companies at the moment, I suppose, but they would be one of the asset owners. Um, and then you have kind of like the designers of, of kind of those new schemes um, and constructors um, and then product and material suppliers. And each kind of one should in that flow, but it's sort of represented in that diagram that you probably can't see with the, the colored ones, but also here. So the designers should be challenging the asset owners about the way, you know, do they need to actually build this new thing or change it in the way that they're proposing? Um, and the constructors should also be challenging the designers in the way they've designed it. And product material suppliers should be challenging the constructors in terms of, you know, could you be using more sustainable materials? That's the general kind of gist. And in terms of its kind of like high level ambition, I've absolutely no problem with that. The interesting bit is kind of like, well, um, it's probably up on the screen. So any of you can read and get the answer. But like, if you were to understand those asset owners, for anybody in the room who could see where the natural fit for an archaeology company would be in past 2080. <laughs> well, that's one of them. Yeah, unfortunately, you have to, you can choose more than one role, to be fair. So, but I'm imagining that many of the archaeology companies in here are not classed as an asset owner or a designer in, you know, in that they're not designing the road scheme or, or similar. So we, we, we've kind of come to the kind of conclusion that probably the least worst fit is, is the constructor element. Um, it fits where you are in, I think, better in terms of the overall kind of life cycle of the project. Um, and, you know, clearly you're not kind of, you know, supplying literally material in terms of, you know, aggregates and so on. Um, and really the standard, I think, has been written with, in, with the idea of the principal contractor in mind, you know, the idea that they can influence the designer. I suspect that, you know, the idea that maybe, you know, you can please, please put me right, by the way, if my assumption is wrong, but you guys probably don't have too much influence over the, the, the design of any road or similar scheme. Um, and when we've spoken to BSI, because BSI pretty much are the only third party certification body in there. So they're going to do very well out of this national highways decision. Um, about what well, like fundamentally there are a lot of clauses in this even as a constructor that we don't think applies to the archaeology they've kind of turned around and said well the thing about a PAS is it's not an ISO and because of that that means that some of the clause we can kind of we can dodge and dive and and decide what's suitable whereas if anybody's familiar with like ISO 14001 or 9001 you're pretty much said you must do this or you should do this. Um, 
in in Paz, we there's probably going to be some interesting conversations in those first kind of like third party certification audits. So we go, we've been through the stand and we think that's relevant, that's not relevant, that is relevant, and so on. And I have unfortunately had to go through that process um, as as part of the, uh, um, but it but it does give you kind of some good clarity as to where and what we think we should do. So. Within PAS 2080, there are kind of a number of key clauses, um, and they tend to be quite similar bet between a lot of kind of um, these kind of process-based improvements. So whether that be 14001, the Environmental Management Standard, or, or this PAS 2080. So clearly, they want to see leadership, and they want to be able to ensure that you know that um, carbon and, and environmental management is being taken seriously by the people at the top um, in all of those organisations, whichever of the four um, you are. They want to see target setting and baselines, so essentially quantifying and how you're going to improve. And then we end up in this kind of continual improvement cycle. You know, we're assessing, we're monitoring and reporting, and then we'll, I'm not quite sure what procurement gets in that cycle, but you know, you're purchasing in the right way. With the overall goal that we're integrating carbon into decision making. Now, <clears throat> there's arguments about do you do that by putting a price on carbon, but Funnily enough, no, not many organizations are actually willing to do that. Microsoft is one of the rare ones who do at the moment. And the outcome they want is obviously decarbonization and then claims of conformity. So claims of conformity are where you know, Oxford or Cotswold Archaeology can say that you know, we have undertaken this project in compliance with PAS 2080. And they want that at the organizational level, by the way, not at the um, uh, national highways on that, the organizational rather than at the project level. So obviously I'm not an archaeologist and you know what does an archaeologist or a sustainability consultant who doesn't know much about archaeology put on their, um, their pictures? Well, it's got to be a pyramid and it's got to be someone dusting something off because that's the only thing we think we know about archaeology. So with that, with that in mind, um, we'll use a sort of very tortured analogy. Um, so how are we going to achieve PAS 2080 at Oxford and Oxford Archaeology? It's pretty clear that we probably don't have a choice in doing it, frankly, we'll, with national highways. So what we will do is we'll use the platform. So if we want to build that kind of tower, that particular height, then we know we need to use, use the platform. And frankly, both organizations have ISO 14001 already, um, which I think with tweaks, but not a lot, will cover the requirements regarding, if we go back to that one, leadership is already a part of the 14001 system. Target setting and baselines is already part of it. Continual improvement is already part of it. Monitoring and report, reporting is already part of it. So for a lot of that, in terms of the actual kind of platform that we've got, we've kind of got it already. We don't need to sort of worry too much about it, too heavily. Um, you know, it's, it should be integrated. It may become more integrated, frankly, um, that, and that's absolutely fine, but we've got a lot of the basic structure there. So I think we also then kind of as I say we talked about um, PAS 2080 being the vehicle and like net zero being the destination is we've got to kind of create our system in the way that we aim for the goals. And that's basically creating a net zero compliant reduction plan. So if you look at behind what the national highways have pronounced um, in terms of being past 2080, what they're fundamentally trying to achieve is net zero, right? Um, so it makes much more sense for us to be kind of in line and in step with our aim for, for, um, for net zero and then sort of like, if you like, backfill. Um, so I've called it develop the middle um, and developing the processes with project specific reduction and reporting is kind of all we, if you like, all we need to do um, to be then compliant with PAS 2018 in, in, in view. So we're not, if you like, from, from that point of view, we're trying to make sure that we kind of start with the end in mind rather than doing what a lot of organizations do and frankly, some of our clients do where they kind of like, just look at the next thing in front of them. The next thing in front of them is past 2080. We're sort of looking beyond that to know exactly where we're heading. And then we'll kind of like fit past 2080 into it. 